Welcome along to episode 783 of the Millbar. Jason Forrest here with you as ever. And coming up on the show this week, we'll be finding out better an announcement from 1448 as we chat with Neil Redding from the Arena Theatre. We're having a natter with Alex Fox about dating and how people are finding love. Bobby Siegel will be letting us know about what he got for Thank a Teacher Day as we hear about the Pearson Teaching Awards. Jack Savaratti joins us for a bit of a natter, not only about his music, but also about getting out and about and exploring places you've not seen before. Lizzie Parks from the Schifrin Alliance is along with their latest track, Unconditional. And we'll find out about the Wolverhampton Arts Festival with Wayne Horton. That's all on the way on the show this week. Welcome to the Milk Bar. 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 Uh, Welcome to the Milk Bar. On the 6th and 7th of July, Wolverhampton City Centre once more will become a world of art. The Wolverhampton Art Festival is taking place. To tell us more, I'm joined now by Wayne Horton. Hello, sir. Hello, Jason. Thank you for having me on. Well, good to talk to you. And uh, after the success of last year, you are back with another amazing event to bring the world of arts to life in the heart of Wolverhampton. We are indeed, yes. 6th and 7th of July. Not next weekend, the weekend after. So what uh, have you got in store for us? Visual arts, which, which will be, include um, like glass making and, um, and um, gen- general arts or painting, people doing demonstrations, workshops. Uh, we'll also have uh, performing arts. So we've got a, a roadshow, a live roadshow with a stage and we've got a dan- dance school. We've got, um, we've got Emma Parker um, for us. We've got the Amy G School of Dance. The Asylum Gallery are there. Uh, Dance Force will be performing. The Howling Wolves Community Choir are doing a couple of stints. And uh, Naomi Malice, and Ryan Evans, and various other people are um, all, all performing uh, on the stage for us. So that's going to be well worth look. I know uh, Lindsay G does some brilliant work, and Ryan Evans I've worked with on a number of occasions. And uh, you're going to have uh, just a, a, a great experience for people to come down. They can come along and enjoy the Arts Festival. What does it cost them to watch? Yeah, it's free, completely um, free. So turn up. <laughs> Turn up and join in. Yeah, so if you never need to do some shopping uh, or uh, if you just happen to want to come along and see the festival itself, absolutely uh, brilliant fun down there. And I mean, mean, last year uh, you had a great response, didn't you? Yeah, we had a fantastic turnout. And um, even though the weather wasn't too kind for us last year, we uh, we, all the performances took place and uh, and it was absolutely fantastic. Yes, hoping for a repeat this year with better weather even. Well, we've booked better weather, so that should yeah. do the job. Uh, the, the, the weather was just checking you out last year. It all wanted to be there at the same time. So uh, I'm sure you're going to see some glorious sunshine this time around. And uh, so it, it's uh, it's still it, time for anybody who does want to get involved to get involved. Is there, are there yeah, other options a, open? A couple, couple of stores left. If people want to get involved, they could go on our website. That's um, Wolverhampton Arts, that's on the end, festival.co.uk. And uh, all the information about the Arts Festival was on there. Uh, we've also run a schools competition, um, which will be, which is because um, we've got Victoria Street and we've got um, stalls in the Manda Centre as well. And um, so the uh, schools are com- will be judged in the Manda Centre. All the paintings will be up on Wilco's windows, mm-hmm. and then people will be able to vote. Uh, and then the, the winning school gets a few hundred pounds of um, art materials. So there's quite a lot of junior schools um, entered that. Very nice to see. The theme this year is walking with walk. Um, so it's. Some brilliant paintings. They've already got half the paintings in, so it's, it's really good. So that's going to be uh, something to come along and check out. And uh, so are people getting selfies with their pictures uh, up on display as well. I'm sure. Well, yes, there'll be there'll be demonstrations. So the art the art groups themselves will, will be um, showing off what how they work, how they teach, and that sort of thing. So people are interested in getting involved in art in Wolverhampton, and we've got a fantastic art community. There's a lot of opportunity. And people just need to know about it, Jason. Really, that's that's the whole idea of the festival is just to connect. Um, a, few, a few of the artists thought they'll be selling their works as well. So it just goes to show us the community we have, and again, it's the excitement of being there, being part of it, and uh, you know, seeing people on stage and you know, local people. It is a proper showcase for local talent, and it's going to be really good quality as well. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. So once again, give us that website so people can find out more and uh, make sure they get their diaries aligned with when they want to see what's on stage. Yeah, it's Wolverhampton Arts Festival. Uk. So um, there's online. a lot of information. There's a lot of information on there. Mm-hmm. And then, and I'm, while I'm on, can I thank all the people who've helped us? Paulina and Katza, colleagues, Dominique has helped a lot. So um, I thank all those people. 
we made a tremendous amount of hours they put in. It's going to be absolutely amazing. And uh, thank you for your involvement and the rest of the team for uh, everything they've done to make sure that Warhampton once again showcases what it's really good at. And that's putting on an amazing show. So that's going to be well worth checking out. As we say, it's the 6th and 7th of July. Uh, nip along into Warhampton. You'll see things at the Vanda Centre and uh, on the streets in the city. And it's going to be uh, just an, an amazing showcase again for the brilliant people we have and uh, the, the brilliant cross section of people who make up Wolverhampton as a whole. Oh, for now, Wayne Horton from the Wolverhampton Arts Festival. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jason. Good day. Now, we've got loads of brilliant places to visit in the UK, but if you look at the stats, there's so many of us from the Midlands who haven't even head down to the likes of uh, Warwick Castle, uh, we're definitely missing out. Now, somebody who's spent a bit of time on tour over the last decade or so is Jack Severetti, who joins me now. Hello, sir. Hi, how are you doing? I must confess, I need to visit Warwick Castle too. I have been, I went last year, and it is absolutely fantastic. And it's when you go to these places, it's always worth having a chat with some of the guides and people to find out a little bit more about the history that you can't see that's sort of flying under the radar. A hundred percent. It's interesting because the research that Vira Moretti Sala di Mare actually found was exactly that. It was crazy, like in places like Somerset, 40% of people haven't seen Stonehenge. I think there was something like in Edinburgh, over 30 percent of people had never seen the castle, never been to visit the castle. Um, and I think, again, that the best way to sort of entrench yourself into the local area is not only by going to see the big sites, but when you're there is to talk to people. And if you can do that through, I think, whining and dining and food and drink, that's the best possible way, because I think if you <laughs> want to get to know a place, there's no better place than a dining room table or a, or a pub or leaning up against the bar, having a nice cold beer is a good way to sort of get to know the locals. And through the locals, you get to know more secret places rather than just the, the grandiose places to visit. Absolutely. I mean, I've been to some seaside towns and you, you speak to some of the locals in the shops and they say, have you not been up the back and walked across the top and then seen the look over the cliffs? And you're thinking, how on earth could I have missed out on this when you finally get there? And, and also, you would never have known of that if you hadn't engaged with the local community. And I think, the, like I said, the best way to engage with the local community is always through food. I mean, that's mainly because I'm Italian. I fundamentally strongly believe that. Um, but same, same with myself. I, we live in Oxfordshire. And yes, I've been to the Ashmolean. I go to Oxford all the time. And I love the city of Oxford. And there is always a secret behind every door in Oxford. But it was actually talking to a local farmer friend of mine now in my local pub where he told me that we live next to these great roll ride stones, which are as old as the stones at Stonehenge. And they're just sort of in a field that nobody knows about. And there <laughs> are these kind of like in ancient masterful calendar from a different, you know, from a different era. And I would, there's, I wouldn't really know about it. There's a little sign in the forest that shows you where to go. Uh -huh. But if it wasn't for communicating and interacting with the locals, I never would have knew, knew about it. Yeah, and also, I haven't been to Oxford myself and just followed a walking tour, and I've done the same in Edinburgh. And, it, yeah, th there are 101 different tours in all of these places, and you know, they, they've got history. I mean, in the likes of Wolverhampton, I know we have some walking tours which go around at certain points. And you go and find out about things, whether it be somewhere where you live or somewhere where you're visiting. And, I mean, do, when you're out on tour with your music, do you get a chance to do any of that, or is it mostly sound check after sound check before entertaining the masses? No, it's something I'm quite sort of strict on. And funnily enough, this isn't for religious purposes, but I tend to always like to find the closest local church because I'm always, fat, especially when traveling across Europe, um, there is something when you're touring, it's lovely to find somewhere peaceful, somewhere where you can actually sort of just be alone with your thoughts. And I always find it's really interesting. You learn a lot about a city the same way you do through restaurants and and going and, and hanging out with locals. It's very interesting to see who comes in and out of a church and the history of the church of when the church was built. Um, the wealth or the poverty of a certain area is very much defined within that. Um, so I, I kind of visit churches whenever I'm touring a lot. Mm -hmm. So it sort of it goes from churches, restaurants, bars, places where you can really find yourself actually interacting with people as well. Um, as much as I love to go visit museums, it's rare that I end up talking to somebody if I go to a museum. Uh, whereas if I go to a sort of church, restaurant, bar, or a local park, you do find that you that you get, you can gain an interaction. And I think that's really important to find out, like you said before, the next place to go visit. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. discovered through talking to somebody local. And important to get those in the right order. Don't go to the bar before the church. It may not work out quite so well as you'd like. 
<laughs> but it's, 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 there's, there's so many people who haven't visited local uh, amenities and the like. I mean, in Scotland, 30% of people never visited Loch Ness. Yet we would go to visit Loch Ness and enjoy walking up and down, visiting Fort William and uh, and all the places either side of it. But even if you go somewhere like the Lake District as well, uh, you, you know the big lakes, you know yeah, Windermere, but why not go off the beaten track necessarily and, 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 and see some of the other fantastic lakes up there? A hundred percent. And I do think this is changing. I do think it, 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 there, there's a positive spin to this. I do think. And I mean, I guess it's, it's because of the beauty of some of these places. And I guess that's the good and the bad of social media, that these sort of secrets are revealed, which sometimes can be, you know, it can make the places almost too busy and too popular. But I think it's it's interesting to see that people are retaining a curiosity for their local environment and their local culture. And I think it's important to to have curiosity all the time. We associate curiosity with traveling, and I think that's wrong. I think one should wake up every morning curious of their surroundings, whether it be in your garden or in your village or your local town or your city. And, I mean, have you uh, visited the home of Bira Moretti as well, obviously, uh, <coughs> in, in Italy? Uh, there's some, some fantastic oh, drink there. Amazing. I just had one of the most incredible experiences of my life, actually, with Bira Moretti Sala di Mare and Secret Escapes. We put together kind of the equivalent... We, we put together this kind of finding these really undiscovered, secret, beautiful locations within the south of Italy, predominantly. Um, and I got to experience Calabria, a region that I didn't know at all. And it's a region that a lot of Italians don't know <clears throat> because it's not necessarily that easy to get to. Um, but through that, I also went to Sicily um, and we made these amazing, we made an amazing film, something I'm very proud of because it really reflected and complemented and showed celebrated the beauty of this part of the world this part of italy in particular mm -hmm. and um yeah i highly recommend you guys go check it out you can see it on my social media or the social media of secret escapes or bira moretti as well we've done these incredible videos doing exactly this getting to know the locals getting to know the local customs the local food um, i found myself in in calabria in a beautiful place called tropea which is quite breathtakingly beautiful um, having breakfast at about nine in the morning with a cold beer. Um, there, there was a local pizzeria guy who, who allowed me mm. into his a pizzeria to sort of show me the ovens that were <laughs> over 200 years old. He gave me a cold beer. He gave me chopped onions with potatoes drowned in olive oil. And it was the most delicious breakfast. I've never looked at breakfast the same way since that. So <laughs> it's moments like that that I think are really important to do when not only when you're traveling, but even in your local surroundings, in your local village and in your local town. Yeah, absolutely. Explore the, the flavors and tastes surrounding Explore us. Explore is the and, word, yeah. And, and, and it gives us then the, sort of the opportunity to, to think of things when we do travel. So uh, absolutely worthwhile uh, exploring uh, more. So where do we find these videos then? How do we get hold of your little trips out and about? Yeah, you can find them on my social media, Jack Savoretti, on my Instagram, my YouTube channels, and you can see them on Secret Escapes on all their social media and Bira Moretti too. Um, and I highly recommend there's a lot of little snippets, but there's actually like a sort of short film, a 10, 12 minute short film, which I really recommend watching because it'll if you're not in the mood now to go and explore, your, it'll make you sort of grab your keys, walk out the door and go explore your local village or your local town, because it, it really it really is beautifully made and shows really the beautiful of getting to know the customs and the the, the environment of your local surroundings. And on the music front, what have you got in store for us as we head through this year? I've just done a, an Italian album, actually, my first album fully in Italian called Miss Italia, which came out two weeks ago. Um, so that was another wonderful, this all sort of, it all came together, this wonderful discovery of my Italian heritage. I've sort of invested the last two years into really leaning into my Italian heritage and getting to know more about it and, um, and celebrating it. And so I'm now on tour playing festivals in the UK and across Europe. And it's really wonderful to bring Italian music around the world with me right now. No doubt you're taking uh, your Bira Moretti along with you as well, so you can enjoy that on the road, but always drinking responsibly and oh. uh, and having a great time with it. Well, let, let's keep exploring. Let's see those places and uh, let's make sure we're uh, finding out what's going on like a local. Uh, Jack Savaretti, thank you for joining us. Wow, thank you for having me. The Schifrin Alliance have been releasing an awful lot of music, a brand new album, a couple of singles down the way. Somebody who is part of that sound is Lizzie Perks, who joins me now. Good afternoon. Hi. How's it all going and are you enjoying the music? 
Yeah, I mean, it's been a it's been a wild adventure so far. Um, the Schifrin Alliance is obviously led by Edward Schifrin, hence the name. Um, I don't know if maybe you've spoken to him before. We've had a chat, and he's an amazing fellow. Such a, uh, a a rich life that he's led, and uh, you know, so many different areas to it. And the music has taken relatively recently, yet it's such an amazing sound. And you must be so pleased to be able to work on some of these pieces. Yeah, no, it's been a pleasure. It's um, it came around quite organically, as you say. Edward's had, you know, obviously uh, many lives in different professions in different areas um, already, and this is an adventure he embarked on probably almost two years ago it started um I was actually his vocal coach and I started giving him some singing lessons and he said to me that he'd written a kind of melody on the piano and mm -hmm. written some lyrics to it so he asked me to listen to it and I found it really interesting and you know quite kind of developed for somebody that never had written a song before. The Shiver Alliance is a big group of people isn't it? Yeah, 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 it is. I suppose in a, in a way it's a kind of collective I mean there's the there's Edward and then there's his kind of core band members um, and then we have this production company that we work with in Paris and, um, you know, a big team of sound engineers and that kind of thing. So, yeah, it's a, it's a, a big scale project for sure. We had the opera, uh, the Parisian Opera Orchestra playing on it. So, you know, it's a, it's a big deal. And how did your jazz background come into all of this? Well, I guess that's probably what uh, led me to Edward or Edward to me in the first place. Um, I'm from Devon originally. and um, I went to the Birmingham Conservatoire to study jazz as a degree. Mm -hmm. So probably not far from where you are. Just down again. the road over in Brum, yeah. Yeah. And um, then I graduated and became an artist in my own right, was signed to a record label in Brighton and recorded and released several albums for them. And then that led me to the South of France where I came to perform in 2009 and decided to stay here because I loved it so much. <laughs> And so through that, became more interested in musical education and um, met Edward through that. A good meeting. These things that happen by chance can uh, really turn to amazing projects. And uh, your big involvement here is the second single that's been released. So tell us about what we can expect to hear. So the second single is quite different. I mean, the album as um, in its entirety is quite diverse. It kind of scans from blues to rock to jazz. Um, and this, the first single was very kind of bluesy and rocky. And that this second single, Unconditional, is um, actually a really special memory of Edwards when he was younger and he was um, kind of huddled into their small apartment with his grandparents and his family. And it was the time that he felt real unconditional love, you know, without any kind of the implications of busy life. And uh, so on the track you hear, my voice is the kind of ethereal, unconditional love kind of sultry sound and then Edwards is the kind of very low spoken word um I think more grounded sound so it's quite a nice balance it's quite a um a juxtaposition just juxtaposition of the two voices mm -hmm. and did you find that you were continuing to vocal coach him even when you were then a member of the band later on is that something that just doesn't go away well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the whole process, I was right next to him, you know, for the whole of the album, right next to him the whole time when he was recording, giving him signals, signs, warming up, um, practicing all the time in between takes and that kind of thing. So, yeah, I mean, it was I was very closely involved. I mean, the whole project itself is amazing, having heard some of his work already. Uh, now we'll move on to the single long edition. We'll listen to that in a moment or two's time. But uh, uh, where do we find out about not only the Schifrin uh, work, the, the collective there, and also about uh, your, your own work, and if somebody's looking for a vocal coach too? Ah, well, yeah, I mean, I'm based in the south of France, so, you know, they need to be reasonably local or online. But um, my artist name is Lizzie Parks. So you can find me on Spotify and iTunes and that kind of thing. And I have three albums available on there. So check out those details. Meanwhile, Schifrin Alliance, uh, it's a spelling on Schifrin, S-H-Y-R-F-I-N. Schifrin Alliance is what you're looking for. Unconditional is a new single. We'll listen to it for now. But for now, Lizzie Parks, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Nice to meet you. When all the guns of the world are aimed at my soul when the sky is low and grim I go back in my thoughts To the wonderful place Where love's never been subject to Unconditional love Unconditional heart Smile 
battles of him when the time is a fall when my soul is surrounded by fire I go back in my thoughts to the place where I live where love never been subject to comes to judging people on their looks we only ever do that when we're out and about dating i hope six out of ten is apparently the new sexy a single's favorite realism over perfection somebody who herself is both perfection and uh, and keeping it real is alex fox who joins me now how you doing Jason, you flatter me so much that I feel like you may have been a steamroller in a previous life. <laughs> Thanks Ooh. for having me on today. Well, good to talk to you. And I mean, you're a dating expert, writer and broadcaster and working alongside the team at Plenty of Fish. And uh, it's been a little while since we've had a catch up, but there are still plenty of people out there who are looking for Mr. or Mrs. Wright. Indeed there are, and I have really brilliant news for them. This latest research from Plenty of Fish really is so uplifting that you could compare it to a massive bouquet of helium balloons. <laughs> We've found out that there's actually a really big disconnect between what people imagine other singletons are looking for and what they actually want. And it's really in the favour of the average Joe. If you're just a standard, solid, kind of six out of ten person, which most of us are, then it could be a really hot summer for you. Because we've discovered that around 81% of daters are just looking for somebody who's approachable, down to earth, standard. Yeah, just, just that six out of ten. But on the flip side, over half of singletons still perceive themselves as having to be a perfect 10 in order to be someone's number one. So the message really here is if you if you think you're average, you're likely not to be falling short. You're actually exactly what people are looking for to fall in love with. Yeah, because I mean, if you are looking at a 10 and sometimes even an 11, uh, it is quite I, tricky. I'm very loud. I'm a volume 11 at least. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but pe people do think you know, jealousy can be a problem. And if your partner, everyone's always looking at them rather than just seeing you two and thinking they make a nice couple, uh, it, it can, of course, people have concerns in the relationship, which you know, there may be no grounds for, but still it does make you feel uncomfortable. Yes, I think if you're dating somebody who is a superhuman, super marathon running, <laughs> supermodel type, then yes, you may feel a little bit vulnerable. There might be issues with jealousy. I'm sure that 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 you it's very possible to have a spectacular relationship with someone, a human being who's that close to being godlike. But the point really here is that lots of people have quite low self-esteem because they believe that they need to be more than they are. They just don't feel that they're currently enough. Uh, to find somebody who's who will make their day and whose day they can make in return. Um, and in fact, the, the, the reality is very different. Uh, we found out that the, the stuff that singles are really looking for is uh, down to earth things like 
sharing hobbies and interests, um, mm. having values in common, a decent sense of humour. Uh, those things were all in the majority much more popular and much more readily sought out than uh, perfectly preened, polished selfies that would give Mr Sheen a, a run for his money or <laughs> washboard abs. Only 16 and 9% of people, uh, respectively, were actually looking for those things. So, you know, it is about... Uh, finding the person that's right for you, and it's, you've got to get on. You, you know, you, you, it's it's about conversation, and I know your uh -huh. tips include things like adding, you know, a drop of colour to your world, uh, to, yeah, avoiding being a show off because it's a bit of a turn off. Well, and what else have you got there that are the top tips we should be taking into account? Well, it is still the truth that people do judge when they're looking through dating apps. They do judge on profile pictures. Around seven out of 10 people will admit that they've seen a snap and decided, oh, hello, or absolutely no, just based on that picture. However, they're not necessarily looking for um, outstanding physiques or model looks. Um, what they are looking for are, are people that they can relate to, but you still want to make that photograph look like the true you, but the best version of yourself. Um, if you use colour, then that can help photographs to stand out when people are, are scrolling through. The mistake a lot of singletons make, though, is they interpret that as meaning that they've got to wear the wackiest thing in their wardrobe, <laughs> their loudest shirt or their most ostentatious prom dress. And for some folks, that's just not what they really feel comfy in or what they would be seen in day to day. They're more of like a all black all day kind of goth type or a neutrals, neutrals kind of person. So a more natural way of adding colour to your photographs, if that's you, is to seek out a vibrant background. And I actually recommend that you rope in a friend and go on a little photo forage, if you will, <laughs> where you, you look around town or, or wherever's close to you and seek out these fun backgrounds. It means that you also get to have a great few hours or a day with a mate, which is always a good thing. And on your travels, you may well find somewhere that's a good spot for a date when you find someone on Plenty of Fish. So, uh, yeah, lots of ways of finding the person who uh, could well become the love of your life. And I, th I think that's what you're looking for. Is it, it's the love, is the cuddles, it's the affection, the, the, the you time. And that's what will make a relationship. And yeah, you maybe want someone to make sure they're presenting themselves well. But as you say, present what you have. But, uh, make sure you're clean, fresh, happy and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but, you know, it, it doesn't have to be, as you say, the, the, the perfect physique because... It's very difficult to maintain these things. You can start off, uh, you know, with, with your washboard abs, but before you know it, a bit of comfort and home cooking, that can disappear quickly. Jason, you're bang on. Um, the, the, one of the few constants in this life is change, isn't it? If you <laughs> are looking for a long-term relationship, then starting out with that openness and honesty and acceptance of someone's authentic self sets you up in a better position for the long haul, I think. So what do people do then from here? I mean, do they need to do a complete uh, revamp of their profiles if they're looking for love at the moment? No, I think maybe just checking in with yourself and thinking, is the profile that I've set up really true to me? Is it an honest representation of who I am and what I'm looking for? Or am I one of these people that's fallen into this trap uh, like 53% of folks who are in this, this survey who think that they ought to present a more glossy version of themselves in order to impress. Um, I can very much understand why some people feel that they, um, you know, they might need to exaggerate their, their plus points. As you say, you, you do need to put your best foot, foot forward. I think there is a key difference, though, between wanting somebody to ex like, accept your best self and take you as you are versus not putting any effort in and just expecting someone to take you on. And another key difference that I probably need to underline about this research is that we're not asking anybody by saying average is wonderful. We're not saying you should settle for somebody who, who is, who's not worthy of you. We're not saying, look, just, just plump for someone paltry and put up with it. We're not asking anyone to lower their standards here. We are asking people to, to raise their self-esteem and believe in themselves a little bit more than perhaps they currently do.
So get yourself together, get those backdrops, have a wander around with that camera phone and grab some fantastic snaps uh, when you're out and about with your mates. And before you know it, you could be adding that extra person to the group when you go out to the pub and they could be the one who you want to just dine with for the rest of your life. Sounds absolutely fab. Where do you go for more information and get more of your dating tips, please? If you want to toddle over to POF.com, stands for plentyoffish.com, then there's loads more information there about this survey, loads of tips on dating, on safety, on presenting yourself the best that you can be, uh, and, yeah, keeping dating fun and authentic. Well, Alex Fox, have a brilliant time sharing your tips and getting people into relationships. Dating expert, writer and broadcaster, thanks again. It's been a pleasure. I just got engaged, by the way, to somebody I gave dating tips to. So <laughs> fingers <laughs> crossed other listeners can have the same result. Clearly it works for you. Thanks again. A pleasure. Now, it seems the awards have been out for some of the teachers in our world who are doing amazing things, bringing the kids education as part of National Thank a Teacher Day. Now, Britain's favourite maths teacher, that's written down here. He, he didn't write it, but I'm, I'm sure his pupils love him. Bobby Siegel joins me now. Hello, sir. Uh, happy National Thank a Teacher Day, Jason. Well, <laughs> if it, it, and I know a fair few teachers in my world and they do do a hard job. It is difficult. It's like herding cats in it with kids most of the time. And actually getting them an education as well as keeping them in the classroom can be quite difficult. But it's all about engaging. And uh, I've got teachers I remember from school who were massively engaging. And it's all part of getting uh, the education right. And uh, you know, it's, it's good to see this recognised as well. Oh, completely, uh, Jason, because we know that, again, like you mentioned, all of us have stories of teachers that really influence us in a positive way. And having a day like Thank a Teacher Day, where we sort of recognize teachers on a national level, the teaching awards, but also like individually, whether you're you're a student out there, or you're a parent of a child at a school. I think showing that appreciation for teachers does make a difference because teaching is, to be honest, I would say it's the hardest job, but it's also the best job. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, successive governments have been trying to get more people into the world of teaching, and uh, you know it's it's not uh, an, an easy one to convince people to go to. Uh, I think because they do realise just how much hard work it is. But as you say, it is rewarding, and it is something which you can really see the the fruits of your work uh, as kids go on to you know, their own A levels and, uh, and degrees, and you know they they move on and they never forget a good teacher. Oh, I think that's completely true. So like even for myself, so in my 20s, Jason, I worked in finance. I was a trader at a bank called Lehman Brothers. I won't say too much about them. <laughs> then a Japanese bank called Nomura and then a chartered accountant at PwC. But I changed careers to become a teacher. And I'll tell you what, uh, people often say, oh, Bobby, your banking days, they must have been so stressful. And, and, and they were stressful. But actually teaching is one where the highs and lows are, are incredible. The lows sometimes when it's you've had a tough day, long term, some difficult students, but the highs where you've made such an impact on young people and even like years down the line. So occasionally, Jason, when I'm walking around East London, I get someone say to me, oh, hello, Mr. Seagull. And I'm like, who's this? And I look up someone like six foot four. He's like, oh, hello. And they're like, oh, hi, sir. My name's Josh. I'm like, oh, Josh. And I said, oh, sir, you taught me like eight years ago. I'm now at uni, so I'm doing engineering. I'm like, oh. And, I, and I'm like, I'm trying to remember Josh. Do I remember Josh? And this happens occasionally. I'm like, some, you don't remember all the students. We remember many of them. And then you have a conversation for a few minutes. And this happened last week as well in London at the Science Museum. And you get students, I think, that, that you, if you're a good teacher that makes an impact, that stays with young people forever. And again, I've got teachers, I'm sure you have, that I still remember to this day. Absolutely. And it all helps you on the way to choosing whatever it is you're going to do. I mean, I went off and did a degree in chemical physics and, uh, you know, that, that, the, the, the base work that they put in to get me to the point of where I understood at least some of the maths and a bit of the chemistry and less of the physics uh, was, you know, it was all there. But it, it stays with you. And whilst you may not always use what you're taught on a day to day basis, actually, we don't realize how much the problem solving skills that we develop become form part of what's there. And again, it's the, it's those teachers that do make that happen. Yeah. And for myself, actually, I have one teacher that I, I'm going to illustrate, uh, Jason. So uh, his name, I thought Mr. Seagull is a good name for a teacher, but I'll tell you his name in a second, mm -hmm. even more uh, better than mine. So this teacher was from Manchester, Mancunian, teaching in East London. And you know, like Brian May from Queen, the long hair, the mm -hmm. locks. So this teacher had the same locks <laughs> as Brian May. Uh, he smelt of coffee and bacon because that's what we always had at breakfast before he came and taught our math lessons <laughs> and our form lessons. And he made maths come to life. But his name was Mr. Workmaster. 
Mr. <laughs> Workmaster. What a name uh, from Manchester. And he was a bit eccentric. And sometimes the lessons are a bit like, what is he doing there? But he made the subject come to life. And even though I don't remember all bits of his lessons, I remember that experience of, ah, oh, here's a teacher that really enjoys being in front of young people and, and convincing us why maths is it should be your favourite subject. I know everyone believed him. I did. But it just shows that the impact that that teacher can have on you. Yeah, I mean, maths itself gets more confusing when you take all the numbers out. And if anybody yeah. tries to explain the square root of minus one to you at the age of 14, it is, does get incredibly confusing. But that letter I will be useful later in life. We can guarantee that. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it is intriguing. Now, tell us about these awards that have taken place. The organisation Pearson run the National Teaching Awards. And this has actually been run for, I think, the past 25 years. And sometimes, I think maybe even this year, they actually spotlight these awards on the one show itself on mm. BBC. But essentially, these awards recognise teachers, teaching assistants, lecturers that have made an impact on young people throughout the country. And I think it's great to have these awards because it spotlights people that have made a real impact. And I'll say one is like gives people recognition, uh, individuals, but also it sort of recognises the profession because teaching sometimes, you know, sometimes, you know, there, there are people that recognise that in lockdown we realise the value that teachers have, but mm. sometimes teaching gets a bit of a bad reputation. Uh, but the teaching awards is one of those vehicles where we go, actually, teachers are valuable. They do make an impact. They do change lives. So that's why, like, I'm really delighted we have a day like this where we can sort of spotlight the profession. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we one of the things we forget is, actually, being an amazing teacher is a day-to-day -day job. And everything that happens, you know, the, the good results are a day-to-day -day job. Exceptional is 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 nice, but actually, you've got to have a high standard across the board, and that's what our teaching staff have. Yeah, I almost, almost think like it's like a, being a, a football manager for a league, whether it's Premier League, Championship, League One, League Two. You're with that team throughout the entire year. You start with them in, in September all the way through to May, June, exam season, as it were. So your job is to manage their energy, expectations, motivations. And sometimes you'll have players or students that cause a bit of mischief, need a bit of sanctioning, disciplining. Um, but I feel like your job is to really motivate them. And I know Mr. Southgate, our England managers, people have mixed views on his tactics. But what I love about Mr. Southgate is that he really brings a sense of unity. And I think teachers that can make people feel, oh, yeah, I'm part of this class, I'm part of this school. They're the ones that really, yeah, that, that I think, leave that long lasting impact on people's lives. Yeah. And then no red cards in the classroom though. It's, 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 no, it's all, no, no, no. Try to recover. That. Definitely no two-footed tackles in my maths lessons. That's, that's the way we don't <laughs> want that either. I mean, it would be interesting as well, though, because I mean, for you and your maths class, they've got a teacher who turns up on telly every once in a while. And uh, that that must be a, a, an intriguing one to deal with in the classroom too. Yeah, I think they, um, I think what I found is two things. One is that actually, yeah, they do get a bit excited at the start of the year. Like I'm planning some lessons on money tomorrow for my feeder primary school, year five and six. So they're going to be, oh, yes, Mr. Seagull. Um, but one thing I've realized is that over time, obviously early lessons, they give you a bit of leeway students do just want to be taught well. So sometimes when it comes to like March, April, in the sort of exam grind season, some of my students are like, oh, sir, your lessons are not that exciting. I'm like, oh, it's exam season, guys. I got to get you through it. It can't just be fun, Mr. Seagull, all the time. <laughs> so yeah, um, I think it's, yeah, they, they do appreciate it, uh, but they also just want to be taught well as well. Yeah, and I say the recognition that's there as part of the Pearson National Teaching Award uh, is uh, a, a brilliant way of doing it. Silver Awards are out, Gold Awards coming later on this year, teachingawards.com to find out more. And uh, they can check out more details at the, the Pearson website as well. Yeah, Pearson website. And if people want to give e-personalized free cards to a teacher, whether you're a parent or a student, they go to thankateacher.co.uk. And you can, again, I always tell people, like I once got a giant custard cream biscuit, uh, which is incredible, but I don't expecting people to, you know, it's a, it is a cost of living crisis. So there's a free uh, e-card you can give on thankateacher.co.uk. A brilliant way of doing it. And just to be fair, I mean, there's only, only so many best teacher mugs that you can cope <laughs> I know, I've got my, I'm looking at my cupboard at home. I've got so many of them. Sometimes I feel a bit uh, cheated because I'm like, Another math teacher got given the greatest teacher by the same student the year after. I'm like, what happened to me? I thought I was the greatest teacher. <laughs> we, uh, we, we all know that you are. That's the case. That is the way it is. Uh, Bobby Siegel, always good to speak to you. Thank you for joining us. And I, I don't want any homework this time, OK? Can I just stick with just uh, having the conversation and leaving it there? Is that all right? Uh, OK, I, I, next time, Jason, I'll set homework. Well, not for I'll, today, though. No. I'll do some algebra. <laughs> it's differential <laughs> integration that gets me every time. There we are. <laughs> Love you speaking to you as ever. Thanks again, mate. Thank you, Jason.
Now, this September, once again, sees the return of 1448 to Wolverhampton, the theatre production, which is it's so fast, it, it, it can't possibly stop. You got, you've got uh, 14 new plays in 48 hours, and it, it's just truly awesome to be part of. I love the whole thing. It's amazing. Neil Redding joins me now because there are things afoot. There is something going on. There's an announcement. What's happening? There is. Uh, well, it's, I suppose it's a bittersweet announcement, really. Um, we are coming back in September, but it will be the last uh, 1448 Wolverhampton. Um, brackets for a bit, close brackets. <laughs> um, so we are We're going to take a pause. This will be the 10th year that we've done 1448 in uh, in Wolverhampton at the Arena Theatre, and we're going to take a bit of a break after this one. Um, for We don't really know for how long, a couple of years maybe, um, but we're just going to give um, the th- a, bit like, a bit like Glastonbury, we mm-hmm. have a couple of fallow years, let the cows reclaim the land, and... Um, and uh, and then we're back. So yeah, that's 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 where we where we found ourselves. So it's it's yeah, that's the big announcement um, that we've made is that this is going to be the last fourteen forty eight Wolverhampton for a bit. Um, so those people that have been wanting to be get involved for ten years, those people that have wanted to see what it is that we do for ten years, we don't know when we're coming back. So this is your chance. This is your <laughs> chance to get involved. This is your chance to take part, and this is your chance to come and support this incredible festival of creativity. Yeah, because you get to be part of it somehow, pretty much either way, just by being an audience member, that's important. We need audiences for these things, otherwise it's just a show that with no one sees. But these are shows which are always worth seeing for all sorts of different reasons. Uh, but equally, if you're there on the Friday night, you could be helping to choose what the productions are all about on the uh, on the Saturday night. Yeah, so as much of the festival as possible is done at random. So um, the theme for the plays each day is drawn at random. On the first day, it's drawn by the company themselves. Everyone, when they arrive, puts in a theme into a hat. And yeah, on the second night, then the the uh, the audience get to do the same. They get to put themes in the hat and then somebody in the audience gets to draw. I think you've drawn one in the past. I think uh, I have, yeah. Jason, for us to, to run away with. And then... Uh, seven writers go away overnight. They write 10 minute plays uh, in the morning. Those plays are drawn at random by seven directors. They are cast at random. Uh, and then throughout the day, those shows are put together. They're designed, they're scored, the band uh, learn songs to go along with the uh, with the plays. The design team create miracles out of cardboard to give us <laughs> sets and props and all sorts of bits and pieces. And then every uh, at the evening, we go at, um, at seven o'clock and again at 9.30, we moved things forward an hour last year. That seemed to work. So we're doing that again. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we create 14 plays from scratch in 48 hours and then they're gone. So this is your not only, you know, every show at the 1448 is the last chance to see these plays. Um, and this is the last chance to see them in Wolverhampton for, for a while. Yeah, the premieres and that's to opportunity, both all rolled into one. Uh, you, you, you two chances on the night. I mean, if you enjoy it, you could always grab tickets for the second performance as well. I always say at the end of the early show, you know, please get out of the, th- the auditorium because we've got to turn around for another audience or be that other audience if you want. Stay and watch the shows again. Um, the whole festival is pay what you feel. So people can pay um, whatever they can afford to come and see the shows. Um, and what's great about 1448 is that um, we we will take your money up front. We'll also take your money at the end of the show if you want. <laughs> and um, we often find we make a lot more money post-show than we do pre-show. And that's always a mark of um, the ingenuity and the effort that the company have put into making the shows for the for the audience. But, I mean, the whole concept of itself is amazing. And 30 years old this year, isn't it? Nearly, yeah. I think I think we've got a couple of years to go before before Seattle marked the 30th year. We're nearly at 30 years. Um, and our friends at 1448 Leicester, I'm sure, are going to carry on, as are um, 1448 um, Mothership in, in Seattle in the US, which is where the um, festival originated. But yeah, 1996 they started, so we're getting close to 30 <laughs> years. And uh, yeah, 10 years uh, ten years for us at the, uh, at the arena. I'm just turning the... Uh, radio off that's interrupting me there at the moment. <laughs> but uh, with so having been to a, a number of these, I'm, I, I've been lax the last couple of years. I haven't made it, so I, I, I think I've got to this summer because I was there for the first one, and we uh, yeah, we did, did radio programs from down there, yeah. and we we've sort of explored the whole thing as we've gone through the day. And it is an amazing creative process. You you don't get to see what happens as an audience, but be just be be, be told that I mean, it is truly awesome the way all these people from all these different backgrounds come together and put together the show that they've never obviously never seen before never heard of before because it didn't exist until they got handed that script probably you know, about half an hour after it was written 
Yeah, one of the things we always say, you know, in the, it, there's never enough time in the theatre. You know, you know, you, you, it doesn't matter how long you get for rehearsals, it's never long enough. But we're used to having two, three, four, five weeks of rehearsal before a show, you know, goes on stage. And we take all that away. You've got ten hours, make it happen. Um, and so it's it's uh, it's a riot, and it's <laughs> it's a fantastic way of being cre- creative. I always describe it as it's a bit like sprint training for a marathon runner. <laughs> you, know, you kind of get get back to the basics of what it is you do and and how you do it, and and we we're open to people as well. We've got spaces. We've got you know we're 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 looking for people right now. We're recruiting. Um, people can go to the fourteen forty eight walls Instagram account and find links there through to the sign up forms if they want to take part. We need writers, actors, directors, designers, musicians, uh, creative people of all kinds uh, to put their names forward to come and take part. There's a, a rule in the in the 1448 rule book, which is that each festival should have 25% uh, what we call rookies. So that's either people who are brand new to the festival have never done it before, or people who are doing uh, something in the festival that they've never done before. So, you know, they've always been an actor and this time they're writing, um, then they count as a rookie as well. And we try and get 25% of participants um, being in in that in that category so that um, we've always got new people coming through. Um, we've always got people that we're developing and, and we're sharing skills with. Yeah, because, I mean, the the fact that you've worked so closely with Leicester over the years as well means there is a home for anybody who suddenly becomes 1448-less uh, after this event. Yeah, absolutely. And, and a lot of us are, are you know, we cut us open we bleed 1448 <laughs> and we'll still be going over to leicester for their um festivals whenever they're held and um and, and when the uh when the economy allows also heading our way over to seattle to take part over there as well yeah well it's uh going to be uh, interesting to see what happens as I say. it's always nice to see on occasion in the past we've had people from seattle come over and be part of it in the uk too and it's a it's a, a share of uh different backgrounds and different writing uh from uh both sides of the atlantic so that's that's absolutely brilliant right give us all those social details and things and where we get tickets and of course you can mention so, arena.wlv.ac.uk as a website too if you want to as always that's where the tickets will be um tickets will go on sale on first of august um the uh if you want to take part the instagram is at 1448 wolves so 1448 wolves um and you can find all the details there and there's a link there's a tiny url link to the sign up form if people are interested and want to take part um if they've got any questions or queries um there's uh, email addresses and websites and all sorts of things it's not very hard to find us we are out there um we're also at 1448 wolves on facebook as well so um yeah we're we're, we're easily easy to find you get to explore the history on there as well because there's still some great stuff and it's mostly stills i mean you can't see the plays anymore because they've gone but it's it's it's, it's still there and uh, it, obviously it's it's always interesting the way you do things interactively at the arena and it is just going to be accessible to everybody too i'm getting this too of course, yeah, we will. We do our utmost to make sure that everything that we do at the arena is accessible. And so um, there is no barrier to taking part or coming to enjoy the shows either. So um, whatever, uh, if you're interested, if you're creative and you want to come and join us on this adventure, then you are welcome uh, with open arms. And uh, and we look forward to, to seeing your applications. Well, Neil Redding of the Arena Theatre, always good to speak to you. Thank you for joining us. And uh, uh, we look forward to a fantastic festival for one final time. Pleasure to uh, be with you, Jason. Thanks a lot. That's your lot for this week. Thank you so much for joining me back with episode 784 next week. I'll see you then. Ta-ra for now. Goodbye from the mill bar. 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 Yeah. Goodbye from the mill bar. Yeah.